Good morning, church. It's a joy to be gathering today. Our call to worship this morning comes from Psalm 104, beginning in verse 31. May the glory of the Lord endure forever. May the Lord rejoice in his works, who looks upon the earth and it trembles, who touches the mountains and they smoke. I will sing to the Lord as long as I live. I will sing praise to my God while I have being. May my meditation be pleasing unto him, for I rejoice in the Lord. Let sinners be consumed from the earth, and let the wicked be no more. Bless the Lord, O my soul. Praise the Lord. Father, we bless you. We praise you. We come to you this morning wanting to worship you in spirit and in truth, and we pray that you be with us. Holy Spirit, come. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. For the mercy and love and grace that has been shown to us in the finished work of Christ on the cross. Let's stand as we worship the Lord together this morning. Son. 
Satan tempts me to despair and tells me of the guilt within, upward I look and see him there, who made an end to all my sin, because the sinless Savior died, my The great unchangeable I am, the King of glory and of grace. One with himself I cannot die, my soul is purchased with his blood. My life is hid with Christ on high, with Christ my Savior and Christ my Savior and my God. You may be seated. We had a really good life back in Brazil, a really comfortable life in Brazil. My wife, uh, she was a lawyer for the government and uh, I was uh, a pastor in my, in my church. And then I visit a friend here in New England. He showed me around and he showed me people not knowing Jesus. We got over uh, 500,000 Brazilians living in all New England. And then I realized that God was calling us. We took the flight and we landed here in, uh, in Boston. 20 days after this, my wife delivered our daughter. I spoke uh, zero English at that time. It wasn't easy, our beginning here. I had to be strong for my wife and for my daughter. So I didn't give myself this opportunity to give up. And I remember that my first job was working at a Dunkin' Donuts. So I met a few Brazilians there and we started some small groups. And our focus was really specific to reach non-believers and to reach people who, who didn't know Jesus. So basically, my ministry is based on a friendship and uh, the people who attend the church uh, are your friends. We started like gathering with people and we found a place and uh, we started doing Sunday services. When people give, they are really helping uh, some families to thrive and to survive, uh, especially uh, at the beginning of the journey. For me and for my family, it's been uh, uh, vital. What I'm learning is if, if God called you, He will provide. Let's be remembering our North American missionaries as we continue to collect an offering above and beyond your normal giving for Annie Armstrong throughout this month leading up to Easter. We are going to have our last message from the series on the God of Abraham. And so it's in Genesis 22, and I'm going to read three of those verses and have prayer with you. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. He said, take now your son, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. So Abraham rose early in the morning and saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Let's pray. Oh, Father, give us understanding 
in this difficult passage and bring us to a proper place of worship, I pray. Revive us as believers. Awaken the hearts of the lost here this morning. Father, help us to care about the some 275 million in North America who do not have the hope of the gospel. I thank you for our missionaries. We pray, Father, that we would care for their work and for the people right around us week by week. We pray for the work of Connecting Church that has been helped by the North American Mission Board, Bruce Outreach Center as well. We thank you for the Collegiate Ministry, Grace Collegiate Ministry. We pray for their effectiveness to students. Father, we, we pray for our church as we plan outreaches and continue the work of the gospel here in Jarrettsville and surrounding communities. Bless that, we pray. We thank you that things are getting better number-wise with regard to the coronavirus, and we pray that that would continue. We pray that our planned ministries would resume, and many of them in April. We look forward to that. And Lord, we thank you that uh, you hear our prayers. We thank you that in Christ we don't, uh, we don't come uh, without confidence that we can be here in Christ. We thank you that you know all of our needs before we ask. And we pray that you would minister in, in powerful ways in the things that we know to ask and in things we fail to ask or don't know how to ask. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Mm -hmm. We sing again. deep the Father's love for us, how vast beyond all measure, that He should give His only Son to make a wretch His treasure. Should I gain from him? 
going to be in Genesis chapter 22 in just a moment. Let me say that uh, this is our last message in the series, The God of Abraham. We've been looking at what we learn of his greatness, how he does things, as we've learned of Abraham following him. Uh, next week, Pastor Matt will be preaching. I will be on vacation. My wife and I are going to be visiting Emmanuel Church in Calvert County for some special reasons, uh, Justin, Becca, and Lydia. Uh, so we look forward to seeing that part of our family. That's where Justin has landed in his ministry, and uh, we look forward to getting a chance to be there with him. I do <clears throat> want to uh, mention that after that will be Palm Sunday, after that Easter Sunday, and then in the month of April, we'll, April will begin a, a new series in the New Testament. What we come to in Genesis chapter 22 is, uh, is sobering. I want to pray and we'll get to the text. Father, I, I pray that uh, you would help me to honor your word here. I pray that each of us would see your greatness, see Abraham's example of faith, but especially, Lord, see the gospel in this text. Help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. This is a horrible test that is put upon Abraham. There's no other way to say that. But in this test, we learn that we can trust God. Abraham already knew that. By all accounts, Abraham trusts God in the midst of what he's asked to do. But you know, there's more to this test than Abraham's faith. That is important. But the horror of what Abraham is asked to do, sacrificing his son, God the Father and God the Son actually do. It's obvious that we are supposed to see that in the text as well. And to say this in our hearts, how we are saved from sin, we sing about it, we cherish it, it's horrible what had to happen for us to be saved from our sin. God the Father giving his son. And I think we're meant to feel the horror of that in this text that we might grow in understanding the love of God. As we see Abraham's faith displayed, we see the gospel portrayed. And we're meant to see both and to be and to grow spiritually from both. First of all, the test of God in verses 1 and 2. Now it came about after these things, Isaac was born in chapter 21, but some years have gone by. It came about after these things that God tested Abraham and said to him, Abraham, and he said, here I am. Now, if you're Abraham, you might have expected God to speak again some assurance of the promises that he'd already given, that indeed I'm going to fulfill things through Isaac. But look at verse 2. He said, now take, or take now your son, your only son. That's an interesting phrase. We know that Abraham had another son, Ishmael, but Ishmael had been sent away. Isaac is the promised son of the covenant. And so in that sense, your only son, whom you love, Isaac, and go to the land of Moriah. Moriah means God provides. Go to the land of Moriah and offer him there as a burnt offering on one of the mountains of which I will tell you. What do we do with this? We have a long-awaited son, born in chapter 21, followed by this. Is God calling for a child sacrifice? Well, critics of scripture would criticize this passage saying, yes, he is. 
But it can't be that. We know that. We know that because we have the full counsel of God's word. What do we do with this? What we do if we're reading it is what Abraham did. We trust God and read on. Or in his case, walk on. We follow Abraham in his trust of God. Notice what God tells him. God tells him who, God tells him what, God tells him where, God tells him when, but God doesn't tell him why. When Ishmael was cast out, Abraham loved Ishmael too. God gave a reason, but not here. He is simply to trust God's word. He is to put God above his love for his son. He is to give unqualified obedience. Pictured here, we must note, is the love of God the Father. It's pictured in the phrase, your only son whom you love. Jesus says of his father's love in John 17, 24, you loved me before the foundation of the world. And in Matthew, Mark, and Luke, the very first time the word love is used, it's the context of Jesus' baptism. When from heaven, God's voice says, this is my beloved son in whom I am well pleased. When we turn to John's gospel, the first mention of love is a very familiar verse. John 3, 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. And so I hasten to say also pictured here is the love of God for the world. This is portrayed in what God asks Abraham to do. What, it, what God asked Abraham to be willing to do with the son he loved, Isaac, God actually did with the son he loved, Jesus. Why did God allow his son, Jesus, whom he loved, to suffer the agony of the cross as a substitute sin offering for the world that he loved, that we might not perish but have eternal life? Amen. Secondly, we see Abraham's obedience. This is amazing as well. We don't know what to do with the first Verses, but now we just amazed that Abraham rose early in the morning, saddled his donkey and took two of his young men with him and Isaac, his son, and he split wood for the burnt offering and arose and went to the place of which God had told him. Abraham takes immediate action, rises early in the morning. On the third day, Abraham raised his eyes and saw the place from a distance. Now the place, the place of this sacrifice must be important. Because God has set them on a three day journey. The place was important. Abraham said to his young men, stay here with the donkey and I and the lad will go over there. He leaves the servants behind. They might not understand. They might try to intervene. Might have been Abraham's thought. We don't know. But he leaves them there and he says, and we will worship and return to you. Now, worship is humbly acknowledging God and his will. Whatever takes place, Abraham is certainly going to worship because he is humbly acknowledging God's will. I want you to notice something of Abraham's faith, I believe, in his statement. We will return to you. He did believe that. We'll find out that in the book of Hebrews. Verse 6, Abraham took the wood of the burnt offering and laid it on Isaac, his son. The fact that Isaac could bear that load suggests that he was probably middle school age, perhaps. Some of you are that age. Strong enough to carry a load of wood anyway. And, and he took in hand the fire, which would be burning coals that could light a fire, and, and the knife. So the two of them walked on together. 
in this scene, verse 6, one familiar with the gospel accounts can't help rightly thinking that Isaac, the beloved son of Abraham, carrying the wood that the father placed upon him, pictures Jesus, the beloved son of God, carrying the cross that God placed upon him. John 19, verse 17, they took Jesus, therefore, and he went out bearing his own cross to the place called the place of the skull, which is called in Hebrew, Golgotha. Abraham's obedience, Abraham's faith, verses 7 and 8. Isaac spoke to Abraham, his father, and said, my father. And he said, here I am, my son. And he said, Behold, the fire and the wood, but where is the lamb for the burnt offering? Abraham said, God will provide for himself the lamb for the burnt offering, my son. So the two of them walked on together. And I, th I think here we are reading a testimony that Abraham trusted God was going to do something. <clears throat> I don't think he's deceiving his son. I think he is trusting God. Isaac's question and Abraham's response, certainly for us, looking back at this passage, pictures the truth that God's own son was the lamb for the offering for our sins. The difference is Jesus didn't ask, where is the lamb? He knew this was the very reason for his coming to earth, to be the lamb. When John the Baptist first saw Jesus coming to him, he said, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world, John 1, 29. I want you to carefully note the phrase in verse 8. God will provide for himself. God will provide for himself. God is the one requiring the sacrifice, it is for himself, and God provides the sacrifice. We'll see that in the story, but in the gospel, we see that he provides Jesus. He requires a sacrifice, and he provides the sacrifice. Salvation is all his grace. Isaac's submission, verses 9 and 10, they came to the place of which God had told him the place, again, significant. And Abraham built the altar there and arranged the wood and bound his son Isaac and laid him on the altar on top of the wood. Now, nothing is said, but Isaac, if, if he can carry a load of wood, he, he could resist. And his father is aged. His father is now 100 and. 14, we'll say, but he submits completely to his father's hand without a word. And it's a beautiful picture of Christ's submission. In agony, in the Garden of Gethsemane, his sweat dripping like blood, he, Jesus prayed fervently, Father, if you are willing, remove this cup from me, yet not my will but yours be done. And then, as Isaiah put it, like a lamb led to the slaughter, and like sheep that is silent before its shearers, so he did not open his mouth. He was, as Philippians 2.8 puts it, obedient to the point of death, even death on a cross. Isaac pictures that. Verse 10, Abraham stretched out his hand and took the knife to slay his son. How could he do such a thing? I mean, think about it the way he must have been thinking about it. God's covenant promises depended on Isaac. The inspired text does not record Abraham's questions, but certainly had them holding the knife. How can this ever be a right thing to do? How could God be asking me to do this? What about the covenant promise? What about Sarah? Certainly Sarah came to mind. What is recorded for us is the reason that he was willing to plunge the knife into his son. And the reason he was willing is because of his faith. 
I'd like you to turn because you should see where it is in the scripture and circle at Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. I'll wait for you to get there. Hebrews chapter 11, verse 17. <clears throat> By faith, Abraham, when he was tested, offered up Isaac. By faith, he offered up Isaac. And he who had received the promises was offering up his only begotten son. It was he to whom it was said, in Isaac your descendants shall be called. And then verse 19. He considered, this is inspired text, so this is what we know went on. Maybe the questions were there as I suggested, but certainly the faith in this way is there. He considered that God is able to raise people even from the dead, from which he also received him, Isaac, back as a type. So by faith, he trusted that God would fulfill his covenant promise through Isaac, even if he could not understand the wisdom of God's command to take a knife and offer his son as a sacrifice. Well, we come, thankfully, to God's provision in verse 11. But the angel of the Lord called to him from heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. So <clears throat> God stops Abraham with this urgent call. And he said, here I am. <clears throat> he said, do not stretch out your hand against the lad and do nothing to him. For now I know that you fear God since you have not withheld your son, your only son, from me. So the angel of the Lord representing God the Father speaking here. I know you've not withheld your only son from me. So now Abraham learns why that unanswered question. God was testing his heart to show to show, because God knew how this would result, to show that he feared God more than he loved Isaac. He passed the test. And God designed that it would show his faith. We know that his faith was real. As God had credited it to him as righteousness, and now we see it verified, displayed. He passed the test. Nothing was more than obeying God. God here displayed for us Abraham's faith. And I want you to realize that as believers today, I don't believe there would ever be this test, but testing does take place. And testing today by God displays your faith. There's purpose to it. Displays it also strengthens it. God is intending tests for his glory but also for your good, your growth. God stopped Abraham from slaying the son that he loved. And we're glad for that. We're glad God did that. But God did not hold his own hand back from slaying his own beloved son. So this is a difference. The picture with Abraham is a little different than what God portrays and fulfills. Because whereas Abraham does not have to, God does slay his own beloved son upon the cross. With the sin of the world upon Jesus, God poured out his wrath against sin upon his own son. Jesus, for our sin, for every believer's sin, received wrath and the death penalty. God's wrath and God's death penalty for his sin. Isaiah 53, verse 10. But the Lord was pleased to crush him, putting him to grief. Isaiah 53, verse 4. Smitten of God, which means struck down by God. Prophecies 700 years before the death of Christ upon the cross. Well, look at verse 13. Then Abraham raised his eyes and looked, and behold, 
Behind him, remember he's been stopped from killing his son. Behind him a ram caught in the thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him up for a burnt offering in the place of his son. So the idea of substitution we see in the picture. Abraham trusted that God would provide in some way. And God did provide in this way. God provides the sacrifice that he requires. And what a vivid picture of the substitutionary atonement of Jesus Christ upon the cross. In that it's, it's our place in the sense that it's our sin, but we would not have been a worthy offering. Nothing we could do in death would atone for our sin. And so God provides himself the offering, his own son. Jesus is our substitute in that he takes our sin upon him pays the death penalty, endures the wrath of God for that sin, and we are forgiven. Amen. Here the ram is slain and offered in the place of Isaac. On the cross, Christ took the place of condemned sinners. His shed blood satisfies God's wrath against sinners. Now let's take this personally. Let's take the picture and personalize it. I want you to picture yourself as Isaac, but with the hand of God's wrath poised and ready to justly slay you and condemn you to an eternal place of torment and fire, hell. But then God shows you Jesus on the cross. He was pierced through for, your, for our transgressions. He was crushed for our iniquities. Isaiah 53, 5. The chastening for our well-being fell upon him, and by his scourging we are healed. All of us like sheep have gone astray. Each of us has turned to his own way, but the Lord has caused the iniquity of us all to fall on him. Matthew 20, 28. The Son of Man did not come to be served, but to serve and to give his life a ransom for many. 1 Peter 2, 24. He himself, Jesus, bore our sins in his body on the cross so that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. For by his wounds you were healed. 1 John 4.10 In this is love. He loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sin. Abraham called the name of that place, verse 14, the Lord will provide. Jehovah Jireh. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it will be provided. Abraham's offering of Isaac pictures a provision and it was done at a place of provision. And it was on this very mountain, in fact, this very place where Solomon's temple was built. And the temple sacrifices over the years trace the same picture that this sacrifice of a ram traced or, or presented and pointed to the fulfillment of those pictures, the su supreme sacrifice of God's son. And in the vicinity of Abraham's altar, and of the temple altar in the vicinity was the place that we call Calvary, where the cross of Christ stood, where the wrath of God against sin was poured out and satisfied, where the blood of Christ atoned for sin, where the love of God for the world was most clearly shown. Truly, in the mount of the Lord, it is provided, verse 14, a Savior taking our sin that we might receive forgiveness of our sin and thus relationship with God, peace with God, eternal life with God. Then we see God's blessing, verses 15 through 19. Then the angel of the Lord called to Abraham a second time from heaven. And said, by myself I have sworn 
declares the Lord by myself because there's no one greater for him to swear by. By myself I have sworn, declares the Lord, because you have done this thing and have not withheld your son, your only son. So notice the word because, verse 16. Because you have done this thing. We need to talk about that. Abraham is not saved by works. We know that in Romans chapter 5. But he does confirm his faith through this obedience. He confirms his faith in God. And James teaches us how to think about this text. Abraham's faith is shown, is demonstrated, is shown to be real by his obedience, his works. And so we say carefully, his works do not save him, but his works show that his faith was real. James chapter 2, verse 21 through 24, is an inspired commentary on what we see happening in Genesis 22. Was not Abraham our father justified by works when he offered up Isaac, his son, on the altar. We know James is not talking about any forgiveness of sin because that's already taken place in Abraham's life. Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness. God has forgiven him of sin. He's in right standing with God. But his justification here is his faith showing to be real, shown to be real. You see that faith was working with his works. And as a result of the works, faith was perfected and the scripture was fulfilled which says and Abraham believed God and it was reckoned to him as righteousness and he was called the friend of God you see James says that a man is justified by works and not by faith alone indeed God shows a born again person's faith to be real by the way they live their life how do we think about that? Well, if someone is not showing the fruits of salvation, we would doubt their salvation. But we would never say that the fruits of salvation save us or keep us saved. No, it shows that there's a genuine work of grace in an individual's life. So in Abraham, we see that a genuine work of grace took place in Abraham's life. And his faith is shown to be real. Verse 17, God reaffirms the covenant and its blessing. Indeed, I will greatly bless you because our, and I will greatly multiply your seed. The author of Hebrews comments here, Hebrews 6.13, for when God made the promise to Abraham, since he could swear by no one greater, he swore by himself, saying, I will surely bless you and will surely multiply you. Verse 17 goes on, as the stars of the heaven I'll multiply your seed as the stars of the heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. It's interesting if you've been reading through the devotional calendar, you came upon Deuteronomy 1.10 where Moses testifies that God multiplied Israel as they entered the promised, and as they entered the promised land, they were like the stars of heaven in number. No accident in God's inspiration of scripture that we would see God fulfilling this promise and making from Abraham a great nation, Israel. But we know the promise goes beyond that to the church. The author of Hebrews affirms God's faithfulness in Hebrews 12, 11, verse 12. Therefore, there was born even of one man and him as good as dead at that, as many descendants as the stars of heaven in number and innumerable as the sand which is by the seashore. The author of Hebrews pointing us to the fulfillment of spiritual Israel, those who are believers in Christ. And your seed, verse 17 continues, shall possess the gate of their enemies. Well, think of the fulfillment in Joshua's day as they uh, take control of the promised land. Certainly the conquest there is possessing the gate of the enemies, those that God was judging, already living in the promised land. And it looks forward as well to the return of Christ and the establishment of the visible kingdom where he, for eternity, uh, possesses the gate of his enemies, 
his enemies are vanquished. Verse 18, in your seed all the nations of the earth shall be blessed. So going beyond a nation as numerous as the stars of heaven to all the nations of the earth being blessed because you have obeyed my voice. Abraham passes the test. The counsel of God's word teaches us to say, as I said earlier, by God's grace, Abraham passes the test and the covenant promises by God's grace stay intact. And Paul tells us that the phrase in your seed refers to Jesus and the blessing refers to the blessing of salvation for all the nations. You need to know where this is too. Turn to to, to Galatians chapter 3, verse 8 and verse 16. I'm going to read verse 16 first. Galatians chapter 3 and verse 16. So important to all of our time in, in the book of Genesis in Abraham's life, these verses. I'm glad for all the devices, but I love to hear pages turning. Isn't that good? Now the promises were spoken to Abraham, verse 16, and to his seed. He does not say unto seeds, as referring to many, but rather to one, to your seed, that is Christ. So the ultimate fulfillment is in Christ. Paul is clearly saying, and then go back up to verse 8, the scripture foreseeing that God would justify the Gentiles by faith, preached the gospel beforehand to Abraham, saying, all the nations will be blessed in you. Abraham's obedience pictures Christ's obedience and subsequent blessing to the world, to all in every nation who believe in Jesus. Because of Christ's perfect obedience, his righteousness, his sacrifice, we can receive the blessing of forgiveness and eternal life. So Abraham, verse 19, returned to his young men with Isaac, just as he had said. They arose and went together to Beersheba, and Abraham lived at Beersheba. That's where we will stop in the series. It goes on for a little while, and certainly there's a wife found for Isaac, um, some other things about Abraham. We'll stop here in our series, but let me bring some implications from this great chapter of the Bible. And they just go along with the title of the message. So first of all, faith displayed. In thinking about this for yourself as a believer, if you are a believer, we should expect God to display our faith through testing. This is a glorious thing to say. It can be hard, but it's a glorious thing to say. We should expect God to display our faith through testing. And I'll look to just one verse. Scripture says much about it, but James chapter 1. Well, three verses, but one passage. James 1, 2 through 4. Consider it all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials, knowing that the testing of your faith produces endurance, and let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. So when faith is tested, maybe by circumstances, maybe by doubt, but something comes along and it is a test of your faith. And obedience is required. When your faith is tested, count nothing more important than obedience to God. That's what we see in Abraham. That's his encouragement to us. Love nothing more than God. Obey immediately. That's the lesson here. And completely trusting the wisdom of God's word, leaving the outcome to him. Faith displayed. So when that comes, God help me to honor you. Help me to obey you. This is what I know to do. I'm going to set myself on that course. We don't expect a, a verbal word from God. But in the word of God, in the different circumstances of life, we're taught how we should respond. And we go in that direction. And we expect 
God to be honored and glorified and ourselves to be strengthened. Faith displayed, secondly, the gospel portrayed. A beloved only son, Jesus. A willing sacrifice carrying the wood of the cross. A lamb provided, but in Jesus provided for us. A God who so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. Listen to Romans 8, 31 and 32. What then shall we say to these things? If God is for us, who is against us? He who did not spare his own son, but delivered him over for us all. How will he not also with him freely give us all things? How should we respond? We should look upon the cross. If you have not, you should believe. And if you have believed, you should praise God for his love. Let's pray together. <clears throat> Father, we thank you for this chapter of the Bible and all that you're saying through it. Thank you for the opportunity to proclaim those truths this morning. We pray, Father, for our faith to honor you in whatever display this week. And we pray, Father, thanking you. We pray daily we'll thank and praise you for what is pictured here of your love for us in Jesus. It's in his name that we pray. Amen. Well, we certainly get an opportunity to Praise God in the hymn, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross. If God has laid upon your heart anything that you need to respond to in a public way, that is before the church, to give a testimony of your desire to join with us in membership or to be baptized or to ask about how to be saved. Certainly I've talked about that this morning, but we'd be glad to speak to you personally about that. If that's the case, just come while I'm standing here at the front. We will stand and sing, When I Survey the Wondrous Cross.